So yeah, I'm Chris. So we're going to talk about um, some of this is from my PhD that I did at Monash. So that's why we have all these sponsors down here below. So they, they helped make that happen when I was doing my PhD. And then the, the latter half of the presentation is, is not Monash research, but it's, it was kind of ideas I got continuing on from that. So we're going to talk about orogenic gold. So I, I do always have um, this slide at the beginning, which is almost as old as I am, but it's a really good slide. Uh, it's just to clarify what, what orogenic gold is. So, you know, gold associated with orogeny uh, doesn't really cut it because a lot of them are. But uh, we're, we're talking about like metamorphic vein hosted gold deposits. So the quick 101 for these things, um, you know, they're looking at a source transport deposition model. Uh, the source of fluids for these deposits is uh, it's metamorphic fluids. So these things are, you know, water rich, low salinity, high in CO2. Um, the idea is that gold comes from the green schist amphibolite boundaries. So the breakdown of pyrotite to peritite gives us metals. And then the breakdown of, you know, chloride and other micas into amphibole gives us the, the actual fluid to carry these things. So they're, they're about mesothermal depth, usually mid crustal block depth and moderate temperature, you know, it's 300 plus or minus 50 degrees, but they actually, they could be a lot lower temperature than that when they're hosted. Um, gold's transported through a hydrosulfide complex near neutral. And then where they deposit is usually in splay structures or second and third order structures off of um, big regional fault systems. So big regional faults don't usually have orogenic gold deposits on them. It's usually some, some trap subsidiary to that. So whether it's a fold hinge or the second or third order fault, uh, the mechanisms sort of as a rule of thumb is usually like wall rock sulfidation. So stripping sulfur off of gold in this complex here. I suppose you guys can see my, my mouse maybe. But uh, yeah, you can uh, strip sulfur off of gold and have gold come out. You can make, you know, pyrite, for example. Uh, you can reduce it by interacting with carbon. Uh, rapid pressure decrease helps. I don't think it's a smoking gun for making gold occur, but that's another conversation. But it does help these things happen. And the normal host is usually greenstone belts in the Archean and then slate, uh, slate belts or turbidite belts in the Phanerozoic. Uh, the kind of uh, tectonic environment you're looking at is an accretionary wedge usually. They can happen in other areas. This is sort of like the textbook example of where these things like to occur. And because we're going to be talking about geochem modeling, uh, we, we got to look at some geochem reactions. So really, I just like showing off this cube. I spent a lot of time making this cube. but. Um, what, what this cube shows is just the, the dominant uh, gold bearing ligand. So gold, hydrogen, sulfide, and bisulfide. These contours here are contours for gold in a fluid. So 100 PPV is a sweet point in the middle, 10 PPV is after it, and one is the clear bit. And what this cube represents is how much fluid you need to make an appropriate amount of gold. So 0.8 meters cubed of gold is this cube here. And this is the amount of fluid you need to make that with a fluid that's carrying in this concentration. So I just wanna go over some quick mineral reactions for how gold deposits, because we're gonna be referring to these throughout the talk a little bit. So usually the number one rule for making an orogenic gold deposit is to basically decrease the activity of sulfur in the fluid. So because gold is being uh, carted around by hydrogen sulfide complexes, if you can basically strip that sulfur out, you can make gold deposit. So these are the main two reactions people like to think about for orogenic gold. Um, Another one down here is, is, it's an example of how you can basically strip the sulfur off is by uh, forming pyrite. So you lead to either gold in a sulfide mineral or maybe around a sulfide mineral. Uh, this is called sulfidation. So you hear me talk about wall rock sulfidation. That's what this reaction is. Uh, so it's, it's dependent on the amount of iron that's in the host rocks. So normally a high iron to iron magnesium ratio is good for this. Um, so in iron formations of tholeites or other shales, and then, of course, changing the fluid chemistry is going to lead to wall rock al um, alteration. So you'll change the pH of the fluid, the sulfidation of the fluid, and the oxygen fugacity of the fluid. And then there's other ways that you can change um, basically what sulfur does that's not necessarily related to making a sulfide mineral. So for example, reacting with carbon makes a, a methane phase. So water in a fluid can react with graphite, for example, in a shale bed, and you can make methane. And then there's been good studies to show that methane makes a vapor phase that then sequesters H2S. So by making this sort of mineral reaction by reacting with graphite, you could then drive reactions one and two to then strip H2S away from gold. And you can have you know, native gold in a vein, for example. And then there's other things that can do it. So fluid pH and oxygen fugacity can also drive deposition. So you can see that on this graph here. We have oxygen fugacity on the y-axis and pH on the x. So if you have any other reaction that can basically knock yourself off this red triangle, you can start making gold deposits. 
So just an example is, um, you know, H2S going into a vapor phase or even just hydrogen going into a vapor phase can change the oxidation of a fluid, uh, well, like the redox. And then also taking CO2 out of a fluid and into a vapor phase, that can change the pH of a fluid. So it, it basically makes um, uh, carbonic acid start to play a role in your fluid. So you can, you can knock the pH of your fluid by taking CO2 out. So organic gold deposits are really fun and interesting. So there is a variance that you get with depth. So we have here a deposit style and sort of the critical wall rock mineralogy here. And you can see how things change with depth. So at shallower levels, we see that breccia loads and vein sets are important and carbonate and white mica is a critical bit of the wall rock mineralogy. And as you go deeper, the sort of the structural host goes into sort of laminated veins and shear veins. And then you start to look at more diopside, amphibole and biotite being important. So there's, there's this terminology for epizonal, mesozonal, and hypozonal orogenic deposits. So they, they change as a function of depth and they change as a function of their mineralogy. So their formation mechanisms also kind of change as a function of depth. So the interesting, about or, the interesting thing about orogenic deposits, or I think it's really interesting, is that we can't really monitor them forming like other gold deposits. So for example, you can look at a epithermal gold deposit and then you can look at a modern day hot spring and start to think about, oh, how's this thing forming, you know? Or even um, if you think about a VMS deposit, you could look at black smokers on the seafloor and then think about how they form. But uh, these things are usually kind of deep occurring earthquakes. So there's no way to really monitor their formation, which means it's, it's kind of exciting. It's a bit more of a black box. And because they're very much structurally controlled, but have a geochemical trigger, it takes a lot of subdisciplines of geology to understand them, which I think is great. So we're going to look at how geochem modeling can help us basically see inside these systems, how we can understand them a little bit better. So for, for modeling, um, basically all geochem mod models do is they can assess and analyze chemical reactions in a geological system. It doesn't have to be an ore deposit. It can be whatever you like. Um, but these are, these are common softwares people use. So geochemist workbench is really great. Uh, that's one that I recommend anyone could try, but I think it costs money. Uh, but the, the front face, like the user interface is really good on that, but it does have a limitation. It only goes to temperatures, I think around like 250 or 300 degrees. So you can't always model sort of a high temperature deposit with it. Uh, thermal calc and theriac domino are really good, but they, they're they mostly for, I think, solid state reactions. I don't think you can put fluids in these things, but someone can correct me on that. GEMS is really great. I think a lot of people are going to start using that. GEMS is also free, so you can go download that and start playing with it. And I'm using HCH which I will admit is not very user friendly, but it's very powerful. And that can model um, fluid rock interactions, which is why I used it. This one's also free, but it's, you're, it's a bit of a pain to learn. <laughs> you might need a bit of patience. The, the front, uh, the user interface isn't that great, but it's very powerful modeling software. And this is what I'll be using uh, today. So the goal is basically to create reaction paths to understand how a system responds to variables like pressure and temperature and rock compositions and fluid compositions, and then look at geochemical processes. So, so for us, we're looking at ore deposits. So we're going to get information about uh, pressure, temperature, and composition constraints on ore deposition, which is good. Um, so it can increase our knowledge on like mineral reactions, ore forming processes. Uh, you could basically pump a fluid into a rock and then see if it can form an ore deposit. Uh, and if it does, you can get sort of alteration geochemistry from it. Maybe that could be a guide for lithogeochemical um, like interpretation of your own data. And if you have enough understanding and enough data, then you can get some understanding on ore genesis. So you can get something a little bit more academic or substantial. So overall, I mean, I think it can be an aid in exploration and target selection. It's obviously a good aid in spicy science. So what we have today is kind of a, a, a two-part talk, if you like. So the first thing we're going to do is look at um, one of the journals I, or one of the articles I published from my PhD, and that was looking at the Fossilville gold mine in central Victoria. So what I did was model the deposit to try to recreate it and then look at the controls on their gold stibnite mineralization. And I put that into a model based on what we know about Victorian geology. So that was coming up with a, a genesis model for Fossilville. And then the second thing we're going to do is look at the Woods Point Dyke Swarm in Eastern Victoria. And we're going to look at different composition dikes and see which ones should be the best for hosting a gold deposit. Um, and then that's going to provide context for why these things can host gold deposits, which ones might be better, and then a little bit of a scientific explanation for that, which I don't think is previously considered. Someone could correct me on that. And then uh, just overall expand knowledge and orogenesis for, for the Woods Point Dyke Swarm and then get more understanding of that orogenic field. 
So because we're in Victoria and both, uh, both our examples here are Victorian deposit examples, uh, we gotta look at Victorian geology. So I'm currently locked down in Melbourne at this uh, red star. Uh, the fossil real deposit is, is up here in the, in the Bendigo zone. And then the Woods Point Valhalla thing is over to the east in the eastern Melbourne zone. So we'll be looking at mainly Fosterville here and Woods Point over there. Uh, here's a nice cross section that was interpreted from the seismic section, which is very beautiful and impressive, but Fosterville is over here and you'll be looking at Woods Point Valhalla over this way. So for the geological history of Victoria, this is, um, this is sort of a tectonic reconstruction on the left and then a, a time space diagram on the right. So the the sort of first and most productive gold event is uh, the, the 440 event. So crustal shortening and heatening. Uh, so this, this makes what people call gold only deposits. So truly just orogenic gold in vein style deposits. You see this throughout the stall zone and the Bendigo zone. Then there's a um, kind of a, a 410, but sort of 420 to 400 ish, which is thought to be a minor gold event. Though I don't think, I think people are moving away from that. I think uh, the current understanding is this is quite a significant gold event. But uh, that's maybe due to the onset of magnetism. And the reason people think that is there's some um, polymetallic deposits that are related to this, possibly related to these intrusions. So when you start getting base metals in your system, you start thinking about uh, basically granitic hosted fluids. And then there's uh, the 380 event. So uh, another major gold event. So possible partial melting of the crust to generate heat for this event. And this is distinctively antinomy rich. And it's mostly in the Melbourne zone and then the Eastern parts of the Bendigo zone that you see the style of mineralization. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at this Fosterville deposit. Um, so I do know that Fosterville has put a lot of uh, resources and time and effort since I stopped doing my PhD and understanding their deposit more. So this is the, the interpretation I came up with a few years ago. But uh, if you do want to know the latest Fosterville interps, uh, probably stay up to date with their releases and their reports because I know that they put in a substantial effort. I don't know how much more that their current interp differs from this one, but I, I assume it does at least a little bit. So uh, this this was my interp, but do stay up to date with Kirkland Lake and those guys for their, their latest one. Uh, so so this is the Fossilville gold mine as I know it. So I, the way I, I viewed this thing is a bit of a, a telescope system. So normally a telescope door deposit is one that has a a high temperature ore assemblage that's overprinted by a low temperature ore assemblage and there's usually some vertical zonation to it. So usually people preserve kind of the, the telescoped terminology for porphyry deposits and epithermal environments. So you get a porphyry deposit, you can have an edifice collapse, then you can get a low temperature assemblage overprint that previous porphyry assemblage. Uh, so there's not much consideration in orogenic gold deposits for that, which is fair enough. There's no edifices to collapse really, but um, I do think at Fossilville, there's a good case for a, a telescoped um, ore deposit here. So really what, what, I, what I mean by that is that at the top 800 meters of this deposit, there's a arsenopyrite pyrite hosted gold phase. So this is sort of the refractory ore that can be found throughout the entire deposit. But at the top, that's mainly what they, they can have there. And then you get to a bit deeper and there's sort of the, the gold stibnite zone. And then deeper again, it appeared that there's gonna be a gold only zone. So that you can see a vertical zonation in the, the mineralogy of their ore. So refractory only into sort of gold stibnite and veins with some refractory around and then gold only even deeper than that. So we're gonna see why that is. So just looking at some more relationships that, uh, that I picked out. So at the kind of more shallow levels in the refractory only bit, this is sort of what it looks like. So pyrite and arsenopyrite in the wall rock, um, some carbonate spotting. So normally this is hosted in the more porous layers. So more sandy layers adjacent to shale layers. So uh, you can have, yeah, pyrite and arsenopyrite grow, and then they kind of fill in that, that pore space. And then a little bit deeper in the deposit, uh, this is when you're getting into the, the visible gold range, but this is still refractory ore that's in the wall rock. Uh, pyrite and arsenopyrite, again, there's a lot more um, sericite alteration down here, I find. A little bit of veinlets with quartz and sericite in them. And then an SEM image of, of the same kind of ore. Uh, in the pressure shadows, we have orostibite, which is like, it's what it sounds like. It's basically a, a gold stibonite mineral. So picture stibonite with gold attached into the chemical formula. That's our stibonite. And we also have some stibonite filling in these pressure shadows as well. And what I have here is some nano sins images. So on the on the bigger photos here, you can see maybe you can see a little red square. That's where basically this nano sins analysis took place. So I looked at various uh, pyrites and arsenopyrites in there. So A, C, and D are arsenopyrites, and B is a pyrite. 
but the the green here is arsenic the red is gold and the blue is antinomy and i think what you can see is that the gold is dominantly in the crystal lattice so in particular here you can see that's kind of striped and smeared out in the crystal that's uh that's gold plus so that's bonded gold in the crystal lattice and then over printing this or at least in fractures that cross cut these uh crystals there's a lot of stibnite. So all that blue stuff is stibnite that's that's coming in and filling in these fractures that overprint the refractory ore. And a little look at kind of big stibnite breaches here. So this is a, this is a fault that's down near the Phoenix zone. And right here is just massive stibnite. It's, it's almost like dendritic. It's a little bit chaotic looking. It's another zoomed in view here, but you can see sort of a, a, a later faulting event appears to be this, this stibnite breccia. If we look at that on SEN, this is it. So a little bit of quartz, tiny bits of gold that are in between these quartz grains. And we got buggy cavities with stibnite crystals growing into them. And here's a, here's a CL image of a similar sample. So quartz is pretty happy. Nice, nice donation on CL. It doesn't appear to be destroyed or recrystallized. Uh, these, these black spots are the open bug space. And then down here, we have an element map. So there's gold in red, uh, irons in blue. So that's a nice pyrite cube. And these are stibnite crystals that are intergrown with gold in these, these buggy open spaces. So, we're so I want to look at the gold stibnite relationship. There's, um, oh, these are some more, oh, actually, this is a really cool sample. This is a, a tomography image of one of these samples. So this is a quartz vein. It's about four centimeters cubed. And we did uh, 3D neutron tomography on it. So what's displayed over here is the gold distribution in this sample, but it's in 3D space. So it kind of goes like into the screen, but you can just see the things full of gold. And then you get these, these textures as well, sort of these open bugs with a little bit of stibnite. There might be belangerite in that. It's a lead stibnite mineral. And then you see gold kind of resting on these, uh, these stibnite um, hairs or needles. And then in, in thin section, it looks like this, these integrals of gold and stibnite. Uh, so, so what's known about stibnite mainly in these deposits is uh, it's, it's epizonal. It's quite a, a cold temperature mineral, we call it. So it's less than five kilometers depth usually when it forms. And it's usually at temperatures uh, around 150 to 300 degrees. Uh, it doesn't usually get that much attention, although it is quite prolific. Uh, but there's different mechanisms that can make stibnite form. So, you know, you can have a change in fugacity of sulfur and oxygen, fluid mixing, depressurization. But normally, it's a, it has to be a cold temperature mineral in this one. So this is uh, this is when the modeling comes in. So this is. Uh, this was the idea of what I wanted to do. So I, I wanted to recreate Fosterville using a model to try to understand this uh, mineral relationship and the paragenesis there. So I use HCH software. And what, I, what you can basically do is bulk react a rock with um, a fluid at different pressure and temperature conditions. So you, you put in what you want, whether it's chemistry or minerals, and then it'll basically spit out phase equilibria uh, the species of different minerals, the fluid species, you know, your pH and those things. And I, I just want to recreate fossil using this. So what I did was I took um, data that Frank Beeline got in 2001. And he looked at uh, basically the turbidite compositions throughout Victoria, both, you know, barren ones and indicator slates and these things. So I took uh, my source rock to be a sort of normal Victorian turbidite. I reacted it with an orogenic fluid down here at the amphibolite sort of green schist boundary. And then I pumped it up through a, 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 a barren turbidite rock. So uh, this is all this was all done with uh, mineral abundances. So not, not chemistry, but um, this would be, I guess, XRD data. So mineral percents. And how I, how I modeled it out was I have a, a vertical rock column in the modeling software. And I took this source rock, I put it at the amphibolite boundary. I took a fluid and uh, equilibrated it with that source rock. And then I pumped it up through a fault through this column rock. So then I wanted to see if I could basically make a mineral deposit. So the, the parameters I chose in here are based on just like a continental geotherm. So what you'd see over here, a normal standard uh, a geothermal gradient. And I used a five to one uh, fluid to rock ratio to try to imitate like a veining thing. So instead of having a one to one rock fluid ratio, which is more like a normal convection cell, I took a lot more fluid and pumped it through a narrow vein, which is a little bit more like a uh, you know, an orogenic deposit or a vein hosted deposit. So, so let's see what happened. So this is how terrible it looks. <laughs> it's not the, um, it's not the friendliest thing to look at, but uh, it actually is quite informative. So what these columns are, is they're the same depths that you'd see in this rock column schematic uh, on the left here. So as you get to the top of the diagram, you're getting shallower. So the very top is about 
0.5 kilobars depth, or sorry, 1.8 kilometers depth, uh, 0.5 kilobars pressure, 150 degrees uh, Celsius. And down here is kind of our source region. There's more mineral species in this column than what I've displayed here. It's just that if you display them all, you get a big mess of, of lines going throughout it. So I, I've just chosen to show ore minerals and appropriate alteration. And what the end number here is the amount of fluid pulses. So this is supposed to sort of replicate fault valving because these things, these orogenic deposits don't usually form in you know, one big vein event. It's, it's multiple vein events over their formation time. So N equals one is basically one fluid pulse, and then two, five, 10, 20 appropriately. And just the, the first takeaways from this is that we do have golden stibnite mineralization, which is good. Uh, we have pyrite and arsenopyrite, that's good. We need that also. And then there's, there's calcite and sericite alteration, which is great. So what we have to do is now basically take these results and pick them apart so that we understand how fossil is formed and what these relationships mean. So just looking at stibnite to, to start with, this is normally a, a shallow crustal level mineral because it needs to be at a temperature around you know, below 250 degrees ish. And the reason why is when you get to a higher temperature, like 300 degrees, you can hold thousands or even tens of thousands of ppm in the fluid, which means there's probably no way you're going to get it out. It just becomes way too soluble. But then when you drop to around 250 degrees to 200 degrees, you can drop orders of magnitude of stibnite by dropping that amount of uh, temperature. So you can, you can cool fluids by either um, taking them from depth and bringing them up to a shallow level. Uh, you could have unmixing or decompression, which can cool a fluid. But uh, cooling the fluid, I think, is, you know, bring it up to a shallow level. It's going to cool. That's sort of the, the most convincing way to go up into cold country rock from a, a hotter source at depth. And uh, again, stibnite is kind of an epizonal kind of mineral. So it's usually up in the upper five kilometers of the crust. But uh, a temperature drop alone is not good enough for gold. So it, it'd be nice and easy to think about a fluid coming up and just dropping stibnite and gold at the same time, just because it's colder, but that doesn't actually work much for gold. So on this diagram I have down here, the blue contours are antinomy solubility in fluid and the yellow ones are gold. And you can just see if you uh, drop temperature on the left here, gold solubility actually doesn't change. It's more, it's more worried about uh, sulfur fugacity in a fluid. So we can't just cool the fluid and have stibnite and gold cold precipitate. We need something else. And that something else uh, is pH, as you see what you need. So on this diagram on the right, what we have is pH and uh, oxygen fugacity. So again, the antinomy contours are in blue and their speciation is all these antinomy speciations. And this gold triangle here is um, gold contour or gold solubility. So we basically wanna move out from the center of this triangle outwards. So a drop in pH can do that quite well. So if we go from a near neutral pH, which these fluids normally form at, if we can knock pH a little bit in either direction, we, we can have gold co-precipitate with antinomy. So it looks like we need to have a drop in temperature as well as a drop in pH. We can't just drop temperature and have the co-precipitation of these ores. So we're going to try to put this model now in context of needing to cool and also needing a pH drop. So what I have here are just the species of minerals that control pH. So this is the same kind of diagram we've seen before, but now we're looking at what's controlling pH in the model. And what this flat line model is here, it's, it's one of these upright columns, but it's tipped on its side so that it all fits in. So in, in this case, things get, um, the, things get shallower to the right. And then also the, the counts, the amounts of waves are on the y-axis. So this is five fluid waves, 10, 15, and 20. And then this will be the deepest part of the system and this will be the shallowest part. So I wanna see what's controlling pH in this system and then what it does it mean for the golden antinomy deposition that we've seen earlier. So we're gonna bring up a pH diagram to help us think about this. And what I wanna show is that when this contour goes from sort of yellow to dark blue, you're going from a near neutral pH to a 5.5. And what that is on this diagram is going from 100 ppb in a fluid to 1 ppb in a fluid, which is an, an ore forming mechanism, right? Which is great. So what's controlling that in our model, sorry? Uh, if we look at pH here, we can see that as we have more fluid pulses, you can see this bump in sericite is basically more sericite into your system. And we can watch this sericite stability increase basically up and to the right. So as you have more fluid pulses, more sort of veining events, if you like, you're basically sericite altering your plumbing. And what that does is it pushes this pH reaction further up <laughs> into the system. So you're going from having a pH drop of 6.5 to 5.5, which is associated with gold deposition from sort of the, 
let's say mid crustal level up to shallower levels into the deposit. So by you're basically altering your plumbing so that it's making a pH buffer. So you would have gold fall out deeper, but as we push the sericite buffer up, it gets deposited at a more shallow interval. And what that means in the context of our model is basically right here. So we have sort of a little bit of gold deposited throughout um, a large vertical extent of the model. And then as we have more fluid pulses, we have more sericite altered wall rocks and it pushes gold stability up to a more shallow level where it coexists with stibnite. So you can get gold and stibnite co-precipitation at a shallow level due to this alteration that's occurring. So let's put it in context. Let's put it in context of what we know about Victoria to try to make a story out of it. So a quick review. So the, the 440 to 420 uh, gold mineralization events are sort of the arsenopyrite pyrite gold assemblages. So this is in the gold in the stall zone. So that happened around this time and in this part of the world. Then we know about the 380 event, which is the arsenopyrite pyrite stibnite event, which is usually in the Melbourne zone and then the eastern parts of the, uh, of the Bendigo zone. And that happens sort of in this part of the world. So we're going to put this together and come up with uh, what, what I think happened at Fossilville. So the, the first event, I believe, was uh, during the Benabern orogeny, so the 440-420 event. Uh, that would happen right here in our stability, and that would be number A here in event one. So I think that the gold-bearing sulfides happened at Fosterville during the Benambrin. So I think they're disseminated because they're at a relatively intermediate part of the crust. So there's been good fluid inclusion studies by Terry Murnau that showed this, where the Fosterville deposit fluid inclusions are basically more shallow and lower temperature than let's say the Bendigo or the central deposit strictly. And then was actually more akin to the, the Melbourne zone deposits. They had a lot of methane in them, a lot of nitrogen, just shallower and a bit colder. And I think that during this time that Fosterville was located below the gold stibnite stability zone. So if we put event one here, you can see it's sort of too shallow. It's too hot to have gold and stibnite co-precipitate together. So in that way, I think that gold was um, instead precipitated into the sulfide mineral assemblages, which are stable at that point. Uh, and then these, these S2, um, these, these uh, pyrites and arsenopyrites, when they are, they're usually aligned to the S2 fabric. Uh, they're related to these fault-filled laminated sort of bedding parallel veins. And of course, they're, they're sericide altered locally and carbonate altered. And then event two, I think, was during the Tabarabin orogeny, where it's, uh, it's at a shallow level at this point. So I, I did some calculations to look at how much erosion could occur over sort of 60 to 40 million years, and it's about 4.5 kilometers. So if you do that on our model, you go from basically right here where event one is up into where event two is, which is the gold stibnite stability zone. So I think by having that amount of time to erode the roof off this system, you're bringing it to a shallow level of the crust where gold and stibnite is stable. And then that's why we have gold stibnite sort of um, overprinting or cross cutting the previous refractory uh, sulfides there. So you got these late D2 spliced host veins. There's, there's breaches that have these earlier refractory ore in them and the S2 cleavage in them. And then they're kind of rimmed by stibnite in some of these veins. And also I think that's why there's these open space textures preserved. So there's these open bugs that have, you know, nice sort of hairs of stibnite with gold on them and they, and they haven't collapsed since then. So I, I think that's sort of the latest mineral event. I think that perhaps <coughs> the, the plumbing was sort of primed by the earlier event, maybe sericite alteration that happened during event one allowed you to basically take gold and stibnite into a shallow level and then drop it out into um, what, where it's found now. So sort of the conclusions of this is that I think the refractory ore is earlier. Uh, I think that gold stibnite is later than that and that it owes that for being colder, but also having that pH buffer. So instead of having, let's say, no sericite altered wall rock, you might have gold and stibnite over a long vertical extent. But because we've altered it up to this point in the first mineralization event, you could drop golden stibnite at a very discrete level, which is why perhaps it's, it's so rich, it's so high grade. So in that way, I think there is a high temperature ore assemblage that's overprinted by a low temperature ore assemblage. And I like to think of Fossville as a, as a sort of a telescope deposit. Uh, whether or not it's in one sort of prolonged mineralization event or if it's two discrete events, I don't know. Uh, they have tried to do rhemium osmium dating there, but there's not enough re rhemium in the sulfide phases. So it's, it's a hard thing to, to date. It's hard to say for sure. And also where the deformations are parallel, it's also kind of difficult to tell. So um, I leave that as an open-ended question. I don't know if you want to think of it as one big event or two discrete ones, but, uh, but yeah, that's how, that's how modeling sort of 
help me try to come up with my interpretation for that area. And that's part one of their presentation now. So we'll get on to part two. Oh yeah, if anyone wants to check out that publication, this is it here. You can just Google that up and grab it from wherever you like. So now we're gonna look at a more, maybe more practical use of geochem modeling. So, so what I've done here is, uh, this is the Woods Point Dyke Swarm study. So I wanted to try to recreate a mineralized system in the different dikes that are in Woods Point. Uh, so, you know, these ore deposit models are, you know, they're meant to give pressure, temperature and composition constraints. And I wanna see if we could basically make an ore deposit there. And then also if we can get things like what alteration mineralogy should you see there? Uh, can you do that and use it for things like vectoring? So instead of using like a textbook vector where you go, you know, for example, VMS deposits have a sericite halo. If you model your actual own lithology, will you get an alteration assemblage that should be more, um, more related to what you see in nature? Like maybe your VMS deposits in mafic rocks and it doesn't make sericite, maybe it makes phlogopite instead, you know? So I want to be able to, basically my, my little pet goal here is to make a bunch of or deposit models in the software, sort of generic deposit models, and then be able to put people's rocks into them to see one, if they can make an ore deposit, and then two, if they can, what does it look like? Like what's your alteration assemblage, which rock can has the greater capacity for making an ore deposit. And then you might be able to use those results for your, your own exploration, your own sort of um, assessment of fertility in the area. So, so that was the goal here. This is the first case study to do that, which is the Woods Point Dyke Swarm. So we'll go there now. So this is where we are. This map is from uh, Simon Jowett. So basically 33% of all the gold deposits in the Woods Point region are related to this dike swarm. So they're, they're Devonian dikes and they go anywhere from sort of peridotites to gabbard diorites. Uh, other than that, it's a bunch of turbidites in the sequence as you know the rest of Victoria. And there's kind of three classifications of gold deposit here. There's like a sediment hosted one, there's ones that are associated with dikes and ones that are actually in the dikes. So dike associated is kind of like, hey, we're hanging out next to each other. And then dike hosted is strictly in the dike. And that's, that's the difference between those two. So, oh yeah, here it is. So yeah, sediment hosted deposits, they're kind of what we were just talking about. You know, they're in fault zones, bedding parallel, et cetera. Might be in a fault hinge or two. Dike associated, yeah, they're often on the margins of veins. So it's, it's veins next to dikes. And then dike hosted are usually in you know ladder veins or conjugate vein sets that are in the dikes themselves. So we're going to look at the dikes since we're going to model those. So the main characteristics of them are basically their composition ranges from something that's more mafic to something a bit more uh, evolved. So gabbard diorite, peridotite. Uh, they do have some alteration in them, so that you can metasomatize themselves. So there's a deuteric alteration that happens in some of the more evolved ones. So they they basically can exolve a little bit of fluid when they're crystallizing and then they can uh, metasomatize themselves with that fluid. So that that alteration looks like, you know, chloride, sericite, other things. And then there's the hydrothermal alteration that occurs in any of the dikes. So, you know, typical for jank deposits, uh, pyrite alteration, sericite, anchorite, carbonates. So what, what I want to look at is these things in particular. So, uh, you know, wire evolved dikes, usually the ones that host gold uh, more so than the more mafic dikes. Uh, you know, inflections and bulges in the dikes are usually advantageous and pirate halos are usually in the surrounding sediments around these deposits. But mainly what I want to look at is why do different composition dikes basically have a different affinity for hosting gold deposits here. So we already talked about geochem modeling. Here's just a little bit of idea of how practical it is or what it would cost to do it. Um, if, if you want to test if a, if a rock can basically be mineralized, you only need a sample of that rock. So you get a multi-element analysis. You do need major elements because, you know, rocks are mostly made of major elements. Uh, and then the more information you have, the better. So if you have sort of like altered rocks, fresh rocks, mineralized rocks, all these can help constrain models to make them better. Uh, my little rule of thumb is that you absolutely need major elements. Miners and traces are really valuable, but having mineralogy is best. And I mean, XRD data or quantitative mineralogy isn't common, uh, but even just having some qualitative mineralogy, like, hey, my dike's mostly made of like, you know, 80% plagioclase and 20% that, that's still really helpful for trying to make an accurate model. But of course, with the more information cost is more cost, but then you also get more understanding if you have these parameters. So we're gonna do a minimal geochem model first to start. So what I did was take, uh, I took data from Simon Jowett. So yeah, as a little disclaimer here, I haven't been to Woods Point. 
this was purely done as a pilot study to see if this technique or this software could be applicable in a realistic way. So, you know, if, if someone was like, hey, man, look at my rocks. Can these things mineralize? I could take that data and actually pump something out that's useful. So what I've done is I've taken data from Simon Jowett, um, and I basically am modeling a gabbro versus a gabbro diorite. Uh, this is the compositions for either or. And then I put the same fluid that I used in the previous models into this. Again, we're going to go to the green schist amphibolite boundary, and then we're going to pump the fluid through the gabbro and the gabbro diorite and see if either of them can make an ore deposit. And if it does, what does it look like? So this is a this is a one-step model, this one. So um, unlike the Fosterville model, where I had a fluid pump all the way up through the, basically through the fault and it altered the entire way up. So it would react with a bit of rock, move up, react with a bit of rock and move up. This is a one-step model. So it goes from the source region and swiftly goes to 320 degrees Celsius and two kilobars. So about eight kilometers depth. They're not a, it's not an arbitrary temperature and pressure. That's just usually where orogenical deposits form. So I took that and this is what the result looks like. So the, the Y axis here is basically the amount of a mineral phase that you have. So the higher up you are, the more of that there is in it. And then the X axis is fluid events. So again, this is veining events, it's fluid pulses. It's forming these things over time. And the, the first two takeaways, again, this is really kind of terrible to look at, all the squirrely lines, I'm sorry, but, uh, but this is basically the minerals that are stable here as the fluid events go on. And then you can, you can pull that information out and you can get weight percents of these things. So the, the first main takeaway you can get from a simple one-step geochemical model is that gabbros have 85 ppb gold, uh, gabbro diorites have 116, so they're a bit better. And this is what their alteration looks like. So this is, uh, you know, you get, Albite, muscovite, calcite, or arsenopyrite, these things, nothing seems unreasonable, but uh, it's giving you sort of a, an idea of what your, your alteration mineralogy should look like if you have a mineralized dike, which is you know, pretty valuable. And now we're gonna try to do a, a better model. So this is an example of why uh, mineralogy is a bit better than geochemistry for these things. Uh, the problem with feeding the software geochemistry is that it'll try to make a rock in equilibrium so you go, I have this much iron, this much silica, this much whatever. And it goes, all right, your rock should look like this. But that might not be what your rock is. Whereas if you give it mineralogy, you go, no, my rock is definitely made of these mineral phases. Now hit it with the fluid. And it should be something a little bit more accurate. And, and also, you get more understanding with mineral chemistry anyway. So here's an example that came from Megan Hoff when she did, I believe, her honors. And this is XRD data from uh, one of the, it might be Morningstar, I'm not sure. Uh, but what we look at here is that gold mineralization is associated with more muscovite and anchorite, siderite and pyrite, and a decrease in chloride and albite. So by having this kind of information, you could then compare your model to this and make sure that it's doing the right thing. So you, you, you have the answer, you know what's going on, and you can kind of get an idea of the scientific process here. So what I did was I grabbed uh, ideal gabbro mineralogy. So similar to the last model we did, except instead of using uh, an actual chemical uh, composition, we're using a mineral composition. And we're going to see how this thing turns out. And this thing turns out pretty good. So we're going to compare these two things again, gabbro diorite at the top and a gabbro at the bottom. Again, the y-axis is how much of a mineral phase you have, and the x-axis is fluid events. And the first thing that pops out um, is basically the, the amount of gold in a gabbro is about 85 ppb, and in a gabbro diorite, it's 9 ppm which is very much the difference between basically having an anomaly and having a deposit. So, so what's going on here? How do we, how do we pick this thing apart? So it, it looks like in the gabbro diorite, this green squiggle here is iron chloride. So again, chloride is the part of the deuteric alteration when it alters itself when it fractionates. So I think it could be important, but you can see that this uh, iron chloride is being consumed and then pyrite is being created and gold is basically following this. So when we run out of iron chloride to make, we run out of basically more pyrite or more iron for the pyrite, and then gold stops precipitating. So it looks like once iron chloride spent, pyrite stops and gold stops. So this looks like it's the basically the gold forming mechanism that's occurring in this system, which is great. So we're getting an understanding. We have an idea of what we want. And um, it's not surprising because usually for uh, sulfidation, of these fluids, it, it favors a high iron to iron magnesium ratio, which is something that the gabbro diorite would have in comparison to a gabbro, which should have more magnesium in it. It should be more primitive. Um, and then just a little FYI, in both cases, um, magnetite breaks down. So whether or not you wanna use that as an expiration thing, 
don't know. I'm not even sure if it's entirely accurate, but if you were looking for sort of a DMAG zone on a geophys survey of your dikes, that might be something interesting for anyone who likes the Woods Point area. And the, the last thing I wanted to look at is uh, basically what, what does carbon do for this? How do sediments play a role? So these, these were some factors that uh, I, I basically found in, in the literature. Uh, so what, I won't go through all of them, but what it says is that uh, carbonaceous sales and slates are usually associated with really high grade gold zones in this area. So what's going on with, uh, with the shales and slates? How are these things contributing? So I found a, a really good publication by Mason and Myrna in 2006, where they basically made quartz muscovite rocks and they doped them with carbon or graphite and they doped them with iron to see how does that control gold deposition. So I tried to do something similar, but for these dikes. So here's my little experiment. We have the, the same idea. Here's the rock column. We make a fluid, we pump it up through the rock column. What the rock on the left here is, is made of almost 80% uh, quartz, 20% muscovite and magnetite. So this is to look at how iron controls gold deposition. And then we have the same thing here, but graphite, no iron. And what you can see is um, the relationship we've seen before. So in iron rich rocks, it looks like you have a sulfidation reaction and gold comes out due to the, the occurrence of pyrite. And gold is stable over a long range of pressure and temperatures, but it, it's not in a great excess at any point. It just appears to be disseminated throughout the entire rock column. Whereas if we look at something that reacted with graphite, you can see this discrete interval where um, methane is made, and then H2S is made, and gold deposits. So this is that phase separation that I talked about earlier from the Naden and Shepard paper. So by reacting uh, water with uh, basically shales or graphite, you can make this CH4 methane phase, which then sequesters H2S out of the fluid that's carrying gold and gold deposits because you've made this, this fluid phase. So it looks like uh, by having carbon in your system or having graphite in your system, you can actually cause a phase separation and have gold, gold occur. So this, this might be a more advantageous way to get really high gold grades. So instead of having disseminated gold along, let's say a dike contact, you're actually having these discrete pockets of gold deposition that's related to a, a sedimentary sort of interface or contact. So the, the added understanding that, that we got from doing this is, you know, why evolved dikes over primitive dikes? I, I think it's because they've, um, they've been self-metasomatized by that deuteric alteration to make chloride. And then that chloride is quite reactive with the gold bearing fluid. So they, they keep sort of uh, the same iron, iron magnesium ratio, but they, they basically give themselves a nice reactive interface to react with the gold fluid and make gold come out as comparison to the primitive dikes, which have, um, you know, not that they don't alter themselves. They, they stay quite dry when they crystallize. And why, uh, why a dike associated deposit? Well, rheological contrast, geochemical modeling didn't tell us that, but rheological contrasts are important. But uh, I think having the sedimentary carbon uh, can promote phase separation. So you can form that methane phase. You can form uh, that, that H2S sequester mechanism. And then if you have a nice dilational structure to accommodate that, you can have um, native gold come out. So for example, the dike over sediment contacts in Woods Point, I hear, are usually pretty good for finding gold. And also the, the dikes are, they're interpreted to tap into the source region. So I've read in Simon Jowett's paper that there's deeper staging chambers, deeper magma chambers that are supposed to be a good source for gold. Uh, so we know the dikes would tap into that. So maybe you do need dikes because they go into that source region. Why the sedimentary deposits so small? Honestly, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe they don't tap into the source region like, like the dikes are interpreted to have. Uh, maybe the rheological contrasts in a sedimentary package aren't as pronounced when you have a bunch of dikes in the area. Maybe they, they provide the, the good plumbing, the good contrast. Or maybe you do need iron content to actually make this thing tick. Maybe carbon alone isn't the only thing driving them. So, so this is a conclusion here. So you know, what, what can we do with thermodynamic modeling? What do geochemical models uh, actually tell us as geologists? So first thing is they, they can predict if a rock is reactive to an ore forming fluid. So you can take an ore fluid of whatever deposit type of your choice, whether it's porphyry, VMS, whatever, then you can take a rock and react it to, with it and then see if it can form a, a deposit. Uh, if you have many rocks, which one can form a greater deposit? You know, can you end up with one dike being good and one dike being better or you know, can this lithology be better than that one? And then once you do react them, you get a little bit of a guideline to your alteration, uh, which you can use for assay geochemistry or field mapping. Uh, instead of using like a textbook vector to say that all deposits form this nice circular bullseye with this mineralogy, it might be the case that, you know, this rock package actually alters that way with this kind of fluid. And you can get something that's a little bit more personalized towards the ground that you're working on. 
then if you have the appropriate data, you can obviously start doing something a little bit more high level or academic. You know, you can look at orogenesis, you can look at mineral reactions. And then um, overall, I think it just provides, um, I don't know, another, another bow for your quiver, right? It's just another, another variable that you can put in with the rest of your criteria. So when you're considering your geological terrain, the history, the structures, the lithology, deposit models, you can also just kind of throw in a geochem model there too, to be like, oh, maybe we should look at this rock and that alteration, you know? You know, and think about, um, yeah, just think about adding it to your, to your arsenal, I suppose. And uh, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm done. Cool. Thank you, Chris. That was actually a, a really great talk. I learned.